Okay. Uh, oh, apparently we need to switch off the lights or something. <laughs> now the lights. I don't know if you figured out the lights have to be. You don't flip the switches. There's, it's not one or zero here. It has to be somewhere in between. That's when it works, which is strange. You know what I mean, right? Yeah. Mm. I, I wish this place was like Edika Chagua. Uh, is it technical thing? Have you guys seen? Everybody's talking about it, right? Yeah. So it's like, a, we should set the standards for how things should be. Hey, but we're not here to talk about that. So guys, um, so, uh, hopefully this is fine. All right, so uh, just a reminder that, uh, just a few announcements here. Mm, this is terrible, but anyway. Uh, so because of the confusion that was there, right? We all know what it was all about. Uh, the last time we met, there was a, a character that came, our colleague, we'll call them. Lecture, I talk, I talk, I was like, <laughs> you, you remember this, right? Yeah. I thought that was weird, but anyway. So, but, uh, so quiz number two is on on Friday, right? We're trying to get back on the righteous path here, right? Trying to see if we can uh, accelerate the pace and make sure we, we cover as much as we can. And then, we, we, we were ideally supposed to have a class theory test number one in the week of April 1st, but, <coughs> but we've shifted it three weeks ahead of time. So we shall have it in the week of April 19th instead. So I, I think April 19th, is, is, it a is it a Friday or something? I don't know. If it's a Friday, it's that week. So it's either going to be a Friday, Monday, or Wednesday. Uh, I don't know because of venues, right? Venue, venues and issue. We need to arrange for a venue. Um, it might just be the case that we write this thing in the evenings or something, right? To find the venue. Uh, um. But but we'll definitely write it in the week in the week of uh, April 19, right? Um, and and then obviously uh, the test will cover the content that would have covered by that point in time, right? Hopefully, would have covered a lot. Uh, also, uh, have we started uh, tutorials? Yeah, but so why are you quiet then? Are you okay with no? Um, yeah, not okay. Here's the thing, right? Um, I don't hire tutors, right? The office that is responsible for this is the head of department's office, right? I have very little control over this thing. Um, so I highly recommend, right, that you uh, have Masakawe and Miss. Uh, Ms. Kapemboa, to follow up this issue with the HOD. They must, this is part of their job, they must go there and they must ask, you know, we are not having tutorials, um, you know, uh, the things that we are covering are becoming slightly more complex, uh, although they haven't yet. Um, so we, we want to find out when we'll start uh, uh, tutorials or when the tutors will start reporting for work, right? I highly recommend you do this today, if, if, if I were you, I'll do this today. Anyway. Um, so back to what we were covering here. We, we left off our discussion at the point when we were talking about what? Um, we started our discussion. Come on, come in. Uh, oh. okay. we, 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 started our, we started our discussion of, um, well, we did quite a lot in application software here, but we started our discussion of system software and, and we actually spent time talking about this. It's our notion of language translators, right? Um, we know what they are now. We can, we can actually cite examples of uh, language translators, be able to explain exactly how they work, right? Um, we specifically focused on um, two different types, right? We looked at compilers and interpreters. But of course, we do know that there are um, a couple of other Subcategories of language translators, specifically assemblers, um, decompilers, disassemblers, right? There's a lot of them out there. But we, we thought it would be nice for us to just focus on compilers and interpreters. In part because going forward, we're actually going to be interacting more with compilers and interpreters, right? When we start programming in Java, for instance. And we looked at uh, an example. We discussed this, right? Yes, we did. We looked at an, an example of how, how compilers work. Now, if, if people, maybe just uh, before we proceed here, in case people don't understand, right? So, I don't know. 
we said, as a, well, as a pro, pro, programmers will write, um, thank you very much, programmers will write this source code, right? Um, and they will use, uh, we discussed these programming languages here. We said they would typically use um, um, a programming language to be able to write source code that will later on be, uh, will result into these things we are calling software, application software, system software, right? but in this case, it's application software. And we said that those different languages fall in various categories, right? So a language can either be compiled or interpreted. If it's compiled, you need a compiler for you to be able to execute the program. And just a quick example here. Let's, let's say, um, let's say uh, you wanted to, okay, add numbers. Just, just play along here, right? I know, I know some of you know what's happening here. Just, I, I just want to showcase um, an example. <coughs> Don't worry, just play along. Um, if this will work here, but let me just check. One plus two. So assuming there was this um, um, programmer, right, and he was um, writing, just just play along, I'll explain just now. Just see if it, if it works. Please wait. Okay. <laughs> so, um, this whole notion of compilers and interpreters, right? So, here's this programmer, he's writing his uh, simple program, very retarded program here, which just adds one plus two. Um, he writes a program in Java, because Java is a compiled language. For him to be able to, to derive this, this thing we're calling um, a program that can be useful to an end user out there, he will need to compile this program, right? The source code, right? So for him to compile this, he needs a compiler, right? In this case, it's the Java compiler. So he would run the Java compiler on add numbers.java, run it, and then the resulting class file, there should be a class file here. Uh, um, there should be a, a numbers. Dot, just, uh, there should be an, an add numbers.class file. Um, depending on what language you're using, if it was uh, Visual Basic, this would be like an, a .exe file, right? Which you, you send to a person and then they'll be able to run this program, right? In this case, because it's Java, obviously, um, you send this class file to a, a person out there and they'll be able to run this and be able to say, oh, uh, Java add numbers and boom, it just uh, prints out one plus one is equal to, th oh, you can't see that. One plus one is equal to three, right? One plus one is equal to three. Yeah, I know it's simple, but the fundamental thing here we're trying to point out is the fact that you need a compiler, right? If, it, if the language is compiled, you need a compiler, right? The compiler is going to convert the source code, right? Um, written by a programmer um, into a version that a computer understands, right? So you need a compiler, right? But on the other hand, if you are the kind of person who this is the same thing here, different thing. If, if, if you, are, you have this programmer who is instead using an interpreted language like Python, for instance, right? Um, notice the difference here. He does the same thing, right? I guess I'll just write a simple statement here. He does the same thing. Uh, he writes a simple program that's going to just uh, one plus two, hopefully, is equal to. He writes a similar program, of course, uh, lines here at number, the lines are kind of different here. But, but, I mean, the things that are happening are different, but still. He, he, writes, he writes a program, right? It does the same thing, he just adds one and two so that he gets three, right? But notice what happens. All he has to do, right, is, all he has to do is, he doesn't have to, he's not compiling, all he has to do is, 
he's using the interpreter to execute the program, right? And what the interpreter does is he just executes each line, line by line, converts it into machine code, right? So that the computer can run it. You know, it's a difference. The difference is you need a compiler to convert it into um, an executable program, right? But for an interpreter, um, there's no executable in between. You just need it to run the source code itself. Right? Hopefully this makes sense now. Is that fine? Okay, that's good. <coughs> All right, so, and, and we also touched on, um, um, well, this, we actually t talked about some of this thing here, the fact that uh, some of the differences, like if someone asks you the differences between um, uh, compilers and interpreters, you now know what the differences are, right? Uh, when you are, you are sharing that program with an end user, you say, oh, I've developed this cool program that adds one and two. Uh, you cannot just share that add number.py file. You would have to ship it with the interpreter, right? So you package your application in such a way that the interpreter is always part of the program. All right, so the next class of um, uh, system software um, is these things they call utility software tools, right? Um, these are nothing more than um, um, application programs or program software programs that are used to monitor and manage a computer system, right? Um, and so this management typically involves uh, routine tasks like um, um, basic analysis, for instance. If you're working on a server computer system, for instance, you might want to make sure that you constantly monitor the load on the computer, right? Um, because you, don't, you want to avoid downtime. You don't want a sort of situation where people are calling you to say, we cannot access the website, you know, because uh, there are so many hates to the website. So you want to constantly monitor it. Um, to be able to firefight, right? Um, so you need utility software tools for that, right? So you're analyzing, uh, configuring your computer system and optimizing as well, right? So uh, let's say you're performing some sort of analysis on this server computer system and then you notice to say, wait a minute, there seems to be uh, extensive use of RAM on the computer system, right? Um, there are tools that you can use to try and optimize your computer, right? There are tools that you use to analyze uh, the computer system so that you understand exactly what is going on, which programs, for instance, are eating up a lot of your memory, right? Um, and then you have uh, tools that you can use to kind of optimize the computer system as well. And of course, uh, perform basic maintenance tasks. Right? Uh, a point to note here, right, is that most of these things we are calling utility software tools are typically shipped with your operating system. So by default, when you install your Windows operating system, you have access to these utility software tools. Things that you use to back up your, your computer, for instance. By default, Windows comes with a, a backup utility, right? You don't have to install that. Do you guys not back up your computer systems? I don't know why people are silent. Not <laughs> mad, mad. It's not my fault that I wasn't here last week. Uh, but the, the other thing here, right? Some, some other examples here, and that, that, please bear with me. The examples that I have in here are Linux based, but I'm trying to remember some of the tools I used when I last used Windows. So things like, how many of you use Task Manager in Windows, right? Task Manager, right? As an example of a utility software tool. You use it to analyze, right? Uh, typically when, let's say you're, you notice that your computer is somewhat freezing and hanging and whatnot, you can fire up Task Manager, right? And what, uh, what Task Manager, Windows Task Manager will do is, it will allow you to maybe um, uh, sort your current running programs in order of memory consumption or CPU usage, right? You're using task managers to analyze, right? Um, you can implicitly use it to optimize the computer. So you notice to say, wait a minute, this Chrome thing, this Chrome browser is eating up a lot of my memory, so this is why, this is why my computer is slow. So what do you do? You use task manager in the past, you'd say right click and say end program, right? You're optimizing a computer like that, right? This is some of the things that you're performing. Fundamentally, all these utility software tools are used to analyze, configure, and optimize and maintain your computer system. Right? When you read up, you probably come across people that will say um, things like antivirus software, examples of utility software tools as well. Right? But there's a whole slew of utility software tools. The giveaway point here is you typically use these types of programs to monitor and manage your computer system. Right? Um, so I have a, a few examples here of utility software tools that I use on my machine or that I used on Linux that you find on Linux machines. 
um, this, is a, this is an application called uh, KDE Partition Manager, and you typically use this to, um, to, to kind of perform operations on your disks, right? So if I have a thumb drive that I want to partition, for instance, or format, I'll typically just fire up KDE Partition Manager, right, and then just use it to format. I do believe Windows has a, an F disk utility that does something like this, I don't know. I don't know what else is uh, shooting in the dark, but I remember uh, there being a, an F disk utility on Windows last time I used it, right? Um, a lot of cool things, so typically, um, when you buy a hard disk, right? Um, some of the common uh, operations that you perform on a hard disk are things like what? You want to, to have separate partitions for different things. So you have a one terabyte disk, you, you partition it in such a way that you have a separate partition where you're going to store your operating system, a separate partition where you're going to be um, saving your data perhaps, or your movies, right? And maybe a separate partition where you're going to install a different type of operating system so that you have the so-called dual boot kind of setup, right? Takeaway point here is you use utility software tools, a utility software tool for you to perform those operations, right? A utility software uh, tool such as KDE partition or FDisk. I don't know what else is there on Windows, but there are a ton of uh, examples. I know uh, there's Gparted, which you can use on both uh, Linux and Windows, I think. Uh, uh, but, but the number of tools that you can use if you're looking at figuring out what, what sort of tools you can use to partition your disks, right? Um, well, so I have a utility on my machine. This is, uh, I guess, similar to uh, your Windows task manager, right? This is called a system monitor utility tool on Kubuntu, right? You notice here that it's listing, um, it's kind of nice, it's listing the programs that are running. Um, and because uh, one of the hallmarks of Linux is this whole notion of uh, multitasking, you can have multiple users logged onto the same system. It also shows you the user that is running that program, right? The, uh, like how much of the CPU it's using, you notice that this program is using just 1% of the CPU, and how much RAM it's using, right? Um, so similar to Windows Task Manager, if I notice to say, oh, Chrome is uh, using up a lot of my, um, my memory here, and I'm not really doing so much in the browser, I can just end it, I kill it, right? You, you end the program, or you kill it, like um, on Linux, right? Um, this is still system monitor, right? Again, uh, you notice that system monitor is being used to analyze, to conduct an analysis of what's happening on the computer system, right? Um, and obviously, an analysis is not that useful if you just read, if you just go through a slew of applications that are currently running, because there could be a lot of applications and processes running, right? But you want, you could be interested in seeing a visual representation of what's going on, right? So there are fancy graphs that you can use here to show. Um, um, like how much of the CPU is being used here. And you notice that this historical chart here is showing you that there's kind of spikes here. Maybe if you're analyzing this, you would be interested in finding out what was happening here. Why are these spikes there, right? Or whatever. Um, but there's more, right? Um, on my machine, I have um, a utility software tool that comes from packages with the operating system that is used to for, for power management, right? So I can configure it in such a way um, that I specify what I need to happen if I'm running out of power. So I tell it, <coughs> if, if I'm remaining with 10% of battery power, please gracefully shut down the machine, right? If I have 50% of battery power remaining, start automatically adjusting the, the brightness of the screen because the brightness of the screen happens to be one of those things that eats up a lot of your power, right? So that you conserve power in the process, right? It becomes useful like right now um, because of the configuration. It's useful because I'm not connected to the mains power supply. I'm using the battery there. So because of this power management utility tool, I was able to configure it in such a way that I, I, I know that I can take a chance that the battery will be enough for us to gracefully conduct a 45 minute long lecture session, right? Utility software tools. There is more, right? Um, again, for analysis, um, it does somewhat something similar to, top does something similar to system monitor, um, only you notice that it's uh, terminal based here, so you, you typ typically analyze these fancy numbers here using the command prompt, right? Um, uh, and, and by the way, 
this this is you might think ah but but why this why can't i just uh, why can't i just use system monitor right when when you are a lucky person who's hired to babysit servers right and, we, and there are a lot of people like us who are paid a lot of money to to actually be systems administrators right typically you don't have a graphical user interface that you use to access the server right you because the server is a remote machine you you connect to it remotely there's no graphical user interface, you're working in the terminal, right? So if you're working on the terminal, this is where tools like, uh, um, like these terminal-based tools like TOP become useful, right? There are a number of them, there's free, there's um, free is actually a command, F-R-E-E. -E. Um, but the bottom line is these things, right? If you notice the description here, they do um, certain fundamental things, analysis, configuration, optimization, and maintenance of the computer system, right? Yeah, so hopefully some of you will be systems admin at some point, very soon, right? And you'll remember this, uh, it'll be trivial at that point, you remember we had a lecture with a guy and he talked about top and, um, and all those fancy things. Um, sort of to, to, to a story about, uh, so even though we are describing these high level concepts, right, but, but these things are so complex, right? My previous life, I was actually hired to, to just maintain. No, but it's true. To just, to just, to just look after one single piece of software. It was a database management software called Oracle, right? So my, I would report for work at eight, knock off at seventeen. I was paid uh, pretty well actually at the time. Um, but just to take care of just one piece of software, right? Uh, and I was able to do that because I understood the basics of how software works anyway. <laughs> But, um, but just, I was just saying that to, to put it out there that even though we are looking at these things at, at a very abstract view here, uh, but they're, they're so complex, right? Uh, we'll see as we proceed anyway. Right, if there are no questions with regards to utility software tools, yet another, are there any questions, no? Yet. But those are not utility software tools, those are no, language translators. Okay. Utilities. Yeah. That's a big. When when one is asked to give an example, they to give examples of language trans of language translators. Do you give a higher level programming language as an example, or you give um, a compiler and an assembler as an example? How how? Um, I mean, so if you, if a, if a question like, like that, now I don't know if people have been looking at past quiz questions, and I don't know if that was one of the questions, or past test questions, but if a question like that comes, usually you get marks if you give a specific example, you say the Python interpreter, for instance, or the Java compiler, or if you just say a compiler or an interpreter, you get, you get marks for both. You know, both are correct answers. Only one is like a, a, a more detailed or specific kind of response. I don't know if you understand the question, right? Mm. Okay. Oh, all right. Uh, all right, so another, another piece of, um, oh, this thing doesn't work. Another piece of, uh, another piece of software, category of software, class of system software tools, firmware, right? And I, usually some, some books will not really classify firmware as being like a, the subcategories of system software, some will. Um, some will actually classify it as being part of operating system software, and you understand why just now. But I, I thought it was important for us to kind of separate the two so that we understand what the differences are between firmware and operating system software, right? Right, so firmware. This is nothing more than computer programs that are made up of low-level instructions. Um, used to perform actions on specific pieces of hardware, right? Um, and some, some, and I'll give examples just now, but some, some key things to note about this thing we're calling firmware is that it sits in what they call non-volatile memory, right? Meaning that um, once you switch off your machine, the firmware will still be there, right? It's still gonna be there. If there's no power supply, if there's no, Power going to the device, the firmware is still going to be there because it's in non-volatile. Non-volatile sim simply means it's, it's kind of memory that um, 
doesn't uh, lose content when there's no voltage being applied to it. Um, so another uh, key feature of firmware is the fact that this is, is difficult to modify it, right? It's, although increasingly, for, for certain pieces of hardware it is possible if you know what you're doing, but, um, but typically it's rarely modified. Right, so once you buy your machine, your machine incidentally comes shipped with firmware, right, which happens to be the BIOS I explained just now. But that, bu that BIOS will still remain the way it is for the entire lifetime of your computer, right? So the BIOS I have in there has never changed, right? Compare and co contrast with the operating system software which I upgrade every time there's a new version, right? Uh, so I'm currently running Kubuntu um, 18.0.4, but from the time I started using that machine, I think I started with Ubuntu 14, right? So every time there's a new release, because I get excited, I will up, upgrade it, right? The BIOS, on the other hand, is rarely modified, updated. But it is possible to, to modify it or to upgrade it, right? Um, so BIOS happens to be like just an example of uh, firmware. But firmware is everywhere, and you typically find this in embedded computer systems, right? The, Zesco customer interface unit that I brought on is it the second day of class when we're discussing uh, computer systems, classification computer systems. It has firmware in it, right? There's no operating system there, there's firmware, yeah? Um, those routers that you get from these um, uh, internet service providers like Microlink, I think I brought a gadget as well, it has firmware in it, right? Uh, some people will tell you to say, um, Mobile devices will typically have firmware. I don't know if, if those of us that are, uh, are very unusual millennials that tech savvy like that, you know how they say, go and flash your computer, right? I mean your phone, right? You've heard that, flash it, uh, download this ROM and all that, right? it's specifically referring to firmware. Yeah? And I bring that up because uh, I guess a few examples of instances where your firmware could typically be changed, right? Uh, make no mistake, I mean, flashing a phone is no easy feat, right? In fact, they discourage from doing that. You, which is why your warrant on your phone dies once you do that, right? Yeah. Anyway, so we're saying here that BIOS happens to be one of those classic examples of firmware, right? The computer is shipped with BIOS, and BIOS is a, is a hardware device uh, which you typically find in your computer where the BIOS sits, right? Compare and contrast with your operating system which is installed and, and sits on your hard disk, right? So every time you fire up your machine, um, it's loaded into memory, right? But the BIOS sits um, in read-only memory, in ROM. <coughs> right, so the, in, in terms of the BIOS, I thought it would be nice for us to just briefly talk about some of the things that are associated with, with this. Uh, this is usually initialized during startup, right? Um, and I, I had brought, I had taken um, I'd taken video footage of the, the boot process because I wanted to show people this thing we are calling the BIOS, how it works with the computer. But unfortunately, I shot it in 4K and I was shocked. It was just like, a, a, is it less than two minutes? But it was 600 megabytes, and so I didn't have enough time to move it to my machine from my phone. Uh, but I will share it. There'll be a, a link, or we can explain more about what goes on in the BIOS in the next lecture series. But fundamentally what the BIOS does is it helps with the boot process itself. In fact, once you start up your machine, the first thing that happens is uh, the, the BIOS is initialized, right? Um, and because it manages the boot process, it's the one that actually uh, facilitates the loading of the operating system itself from disk into main memory. Right, but you can do uh, a lot of other things in the BIOS itself, so things like, um, if you think that you are handling um, very important data, for instance, you can, you can set certain passwords, right, so that nobody loads the operating system without specifying the password, right? Uh, so fancy things like, if you notice that your computer is acting up, you can perform very basic diagnostics using the BIOS, right? So you, you check your CPU to see if there's anything wrong, you check your disk to see if there are any bad sectors and things of that nature, right? Uh, quite useful, and most people, will not even realize that there's this thing called the BIOS. You just see it, it's a, uh, starting up and whatnot. Press, I've, I've people seen the press F1 to get into BIOS and all that. That's what we're referring to. 
I, I, unfortunately, I can't, we cannot beam the projector to show. Yeah. But I will show us what happens. But this is typically how the interface looks. This is for my other machine, uh, my, my Pro Book. Uh, so you notice that this panel is showing you uh, things like I can check system information without actually loading the operating system itself. In, in fact, right, the interesting thing here is because it's a separate piece of software, even if you don't have an operating system installed on your computer system, the BIOS will still work, right? So a computer can actually still perform basic functions without actually having an operating system installed on it. Right? We, we had uh, some interesting debates about this um, um, last year, which is why I decided to bring it up. People are like, there's a, a question that was asked, say, uh, is it possible, does the computer be able to work without an operating system, right? And people are like, no. And I'm thinking, oh, but we, fundamentally, number one, we discussed a certain class of compu computers called embedded systems, which might not have an operating system. So, well, if they work, then the computer can be, uh, I mean, it can obviously work without an operating system, right? But, um, microcomputers can work without an operating system, right? But you'd be able to do very little, actually. Just basic uh, analysis and, I guess, and configuration. You, you want to check sectors, for instance, on your hard disk. See if your CPU is working just fine, right? It does those things for you. And set some security configurations here. All right. Um, I don't know if there are any questions with regards to utility software tools. Is this making sense? Mm. Ah, great. You must tell us if it's not making sense, right? Um, right, so next up is this um, class of system uh, software um, tools called operating system, right? Operating system software. Uh, probably one of the most important pieces of software, I guess. Um, in part because uh, and even more so when, when we're making reference to things like microcomputers and server computer systems, for instance, right? Not embedded systems because they might not have an operating, they, they might not require an operating system. But they're important because they, they, they act as an interface between your application software and the hardware. Because the, the, operating, the, the application software itself, so, so the Microsoft Word that you use, the Chrome itself, cannot interact with the hardware. Remember, fundamentally, we are using Chrome because Chrome helps us tell the hardware what we want Chrome to do on our behalf, right? But Chrome cannot interact with the hardware directly. It must, it, it must go through the operating system. This is what makes the operating system very important, right? Because it acts as an interface between application software and the hardware itself, right? So obviously, it controls the operations of the computer system. Um, it provides us with a way of interacting with the hardware, which I, I just um, explained here. And I, I guess it would be important again to repeat the fact that, uh, when you compare this with firmware, the fact that the operating system, once installed, sits on, on secondary storage, right? It's on disk. Huh? So it's stored on disk, but then once, um, once you start your machine, BIOS initializes, and the operating system is loaded, part of it goes into memory, right? Uh, and then once it's loaded into memory, you see that fancy interface that says login, right? Enter your username and password. <coughs> so in terms of like the, the fundamental um, kind of functionalities associated with operating system, it is a complex piece of software, yes. In fact, there are dedicated causes that focus on how an operating system, I mean, uh, yeah, how operating systems work, right? There are causes that will, um, in fact, go a step further and um, go into depth uh, on how specific types of operating systems work. So like how Linux works, because how Linux works in very different way from Windows, for instance, or from Android, right? So, you know, but fundamentally what an operating system does, is it helps uh, facilitate these four core features, right? So basic file management, right? Memory management, process management, no, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so file, file system management, memory management, process management, and 
device management, right? You know what else is that? Right. So th these are all, but once we start t talking about um, the Voinomian architecture, you understand why we are focusing on things like file system management. This is mapped onto your memory unit, right? Secondary storage is where your files are stored, right? Typically, when you're referring to that, it's a part of memory, right? It's a memory unit. Memory management is also tied to the memory unit, right? Process management is tied to the CPU, right? Device management is tied to the CPU, right? Um, so the I/O actually input output because you're referring to peripheral devices here, right? So you notice that this this is a lot easier to understand once you think about the those high-level components of of the computer system which we we'll discussed, right? So when it comes to file management, right? So fundamentally, uh, if you look at the the, the the basic way in which a computer works. We discussed the fact that it accepts input, it processes the input, um, it optionally stores whatever processing has been done, right, or presents it to the user. So the, the storing part here is what's important when you're looking at file management, right, because the storage of the process data is done in conjunction with secondary storage, right? So these things that are processed are eventually stored on things like your hard disk or your thumb drive, for instance, right? And so there needs to be a way in which you're able to manage those things that you're storing, right? Which is why file management becomes important. Um, memory management here, obviously, we are mostly referring to things like um, primary memory, so RAM. Because you typically have a lot of applications running on your computer system, you need a way in which you're going to um, appropriately share that memory because you have limited resources, right? You have a slew of applications and processes running. So there has to be a way of appropriately allocating memory to those different processes that might be running, right? And the thing that does that is operating system. Process management, right? This is tied to memory management, obviously. Each application, right? I'll take you back here. Black window, no, it's not very clear. But I'll take you back here. Each one of these different applications, you'll typically have different processes associated with it, right? So you could have uh, maybe three or five processes associated with Chrome, right? So there has to be a way of managing those different processes that are running, right? Um, if I kill Chrome, for instance, something has to tell these other processes that might be running to say, hey, listen, this application has been killed, so there's no need for you to continue running, right? Process management. Device management, um, for this thing to become useful, we need to integrate it with a slew of applications, right? Peripheral devices, so I have my laser pointer here, you have your mouse, you have your external keyboard, you have your joystick if you're a gamer, right? There has to be a way in which we're going to manage how those things interact with our computer system, right? Because there are a lot of them, right? How does, how does this computer system know when I'm using my laser pointer, right? Or when I'm using my, my, my mouse, right? The operating system does that. Hmm? All right, so, so call uh, functionalities of operating system, these are the ones, right? But, but when it comes to specifics here, right? Um, there are some things that I guess are worth mentioning here. I um, don't want people to complain that guy goes up to 11 here. Um, so, interaction with the computer system, right? A very important feature that most of us are familiar with. Um, remember when you're instructing a computer on what exactly it needs to do by way of interacting with this application software, you, you, use, you use like some sort of graphical user interface, right? Like if it's Microsoft Word, the, the, those are visual features associated with Microsoft Word, buttons that you're clicking, menu, menu items that you're clicking, right? Um, uh, a whole host of things, right? Panels that describe what is happening, right? Um, status bars that will show you that the, the document has been saved or not, or it needs to be saved, right? That is, what, that, we're, that is the thing we're referring to as an interface, right? So the thing that makes that whole thing possible is the operating system. So it provides you with an interface to be able to interact with the computer system, right? Um, and we just wanted to mention the fact that this interface is not just uh, GUI-based, right? It can be command line-based. I gave an example of uh, remote servers that you might be interacting with, for instance. You SSH into a server and you have, you must ask if, I don't know if people understand what we mean by saying um, command line interface. 
this is a graphical user interface. It is a visual representation, and I can actually move my mouse and uh, click things here, right? File, this is a graphical user interface, right? Compare and contrast with a different interface, command line interface, not clicking here, sorry. It's just uh, issuing commands, right? These fancy top commands, whatever else you might be um, doing, you know, remote login for SSH, right? So command line interface, graphical user interface, right? Two different types of interfaces associated with um, computer systems. Um, right. <clears throat> right, so there's this whole notion of program execution as well, right? Uh, so you load up your operating system, you start your machine, you press that button, it starts up and your OS loads, and then you, uh, you enter your password and you go in. There has to be a way in which um, program execution is going to be performed, right? Um, so typically you start a program by going to your start menu, for instance, and specifying, say I want to start this program, right? Once you do that, right, that execution, the loading of that program into memory is done by the operating system, right? So it just doesn't happen on its own, right? So the operating system has to do that. And, and actually, in fact, you realize that this makes sense because this program execution um, feature here, or task, is aligned with what? Process management, right? And memory management. Once this program is loaded into memory, something has to allocate part of the run that you have on your machine to say, you are going to use this much memory, right? And when you have a lot of programs open, like I have right now, right? I have Ocular running, I have, I have a slew of programs here. I have Chrome, right? In fact, I have two, pro, two different instances of Chrome running, right? I have Ocular running, right? And I have Kate running. Uh, so once, once program execution happens, obviously, and the, the, the program is loaded into memory, something has to allocate specific parts of RAM to the program that you're running at that point in time. And in fact, when you're running the program, like I am running right now, something has to allocate how much CPU needs to be used by that program, right? And the operating system is the one that does um, that for you. And you notice that all these different things are happening in the background, right? So it's, it's not like you are aware as an end user of what the operating system is doing, right? But when you run utility software tools like TOP, for instance, or System Monitor, or Task Manager, you get a sense of what is happening, actually. You can actually see that in real time that um, allocation of CPU time, for instance, dynamically changes with time, right? Um, There's time sharing happening there. <coughs> right, so uh, specific tasks, tasks again, uh, so there's things like uh, file system manipulation, right? When, when you're storing these these, these things uh, or this data that has been processed by the by the um, by the CPU. Typically, the, the the storage process is done using these things we call files, right? And there are various types of files. You can have regular files like uh, your web document or your text file. Um, you can have what a directory or otherwise folders, right? This is a type of file, a different type of file because the container structure it stores other files, right? It lists other files. But fundamentally, the operating system allows you to, to perform file system specific operations, right? On those uh, files and directories, right? So you can create files, you can create directories, you can modify them, rename them, you can delete them, right? Um, I wonder what other uh, functions we have associated with file system, I mean with files. Anyone know what other operations we perform on files like Microsoft Word? We can create Microsoft Word, we can modify, we can save, right? We can rename, we can delete. What else can we do? I don't know. Hmm? It doesn't have to be Microsoft Word. There are different types of files, right? Text files, dot exe files, those are all files, by the way. Um, they're executable, the program itself, it is a file, is it? Yeah. No, sorry, pause. 
I'm wondering why the we've let, we we already understand this. We can cruise, right? Do we already understand this? No. Yeah, but why are we quiet? We must. Uh, sorry. <laughs> But we are learning, right? Part of the learning process involves having constructive discussions. You ask, you tell me to stop. If if something doesn't make sense, you tell me to clarify, right? Yeah, yes. So we'll go back here. Sorry. File management. No, no. No. No, I didn't. I said file management is one of the core, file system management is one of the core functionalities of an operating system. And what we're saying is, when you talk about file management, specific tasks that are performed, you know, tasks associated with this functionality here. We're saying things to do with file system manipulation. And we're giving examples of operations, right, that are associated with file system manipulation. Creating a file. So, I'm manipulating the file system when I come here and I say, hey, here we go. When I created this file, the add number.py, this is file system manipulation, right? All right, I guess let's pause for a while here. We'll let this digest, uh, let's digest this and we'll continue the discussion on, on Wednesday. On Wednesday, I shall, I shall transfer my 4K file, which is 600 megabytes. I was shocked, my goodness. Uh, it's, one, it's a one minute, it's less than two minutes, but it's almost a gig in size, right? Hmm. Uh, because it's in 4K and it's high resolution. But, uh, but we'll, sh we'll, show, uh, we'll, sh we'll look at, we'll talk a little about how the BIOS actually works, right? And perhaps maybe I can just bring the other machine so that, no, I'll just use this. I'll rec I have the recording, I'll have the recording ready. All right, so if there are no questions, uh, looking forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Uh, and please uh, bear in mind that we have uh, quiz number two on, um, on Friday, right? Hopefully, I'm hoping we can finish off our discussion of computer software before the end of the week. Really, we, we are running out of time here. And by the way, when it comes to power management, right? I'm running out of power. Look at this. I'm running out of, please. I'm running out of power and the brightness of the machine was automatically adjusted, which is why it's not, and you can't see it because, but you guys can see it, right? It was adjusted, it was a bit dull, but it's supposed to be like so, because power was running out, right? Utility software tools. Guys, uh, I'll see you.